Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome tonight. Uh, I'm Alex Fafer, Exhibits Manager at the Ames History Museum, and I want to welcome you all to our lecture series program tonight, and hello to everyone watching online. So wonderful to be in person at the library's auditorium here and be able to provide the lecture virtually as well. We are so happy to have this great partnership with the Ames Public Library. Um, I want to mention our current feature exhibit at the museum is Black Trailblazers. It tells the story of nine black pioneers from Ames history. Stop by to see this exhibit if you haven't already. Check out our website, ameshistory.org, for more information about current exhibits and upcoming events. Tonight is the last lecture of our 2022 lecture series, which would commemorate our 17th season of doing this. So quite amazing feat. I'd like to remind everyone that all five lectures have been recorded and are available on our YouTube channel or at amespl.org slash history lectures. And now I will turn it over to Kathy from the library. Thanks, Alex. Um, welcome so, to the Ames Public Library, both in person and virtually. Um, we're always thrilled as well to have this wonderful partnership with the Ames History Museum. I'm Kathy Cooney, Adult Services Librarian here at the library. And the library's mission is to connect you to the world of ideas, which we do through diverse and inclusive resources and programming like tonight's event. So for those of us in person, this room does have an induction loop for the benefit of hearing aid users. You just need to switch your hearing aid to T. We also have a hearing assistance device we can lend you. Please let me know if you'd like to use it. I have it in the back. For those virtually, please submit your questions through the Q&A or chat function, which is linked at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will monitor those and make sure they are shared with our speaker. As well as if you get bumped out of the meeting, please follow the original link to get back in. We've enabled live captioning. If you're not seeing captions, you can turn them on by clicking the CC live transcript button in the Zoom menu bar and choosing closed captioning. And for all participants, as Alex said, we are recording the lecture, which you can find in those two places he shared. At amespl.org slash history lectures, you can also find a link to a list of related reading. And I'll pop that in the chat for the folks on Zoom. We will have time for questions at the end. If you're here in person, we will run around with microphones um, so that the folks at Zoom can on Zoom can hear your questions as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Speck to introduce our speaker. As Kathy said, I'm Kathy Speck, a longtime museum volunteer and uh, the organizer of the lecture series. So if any of you uh, have an idea for a lecture or know someone who would be a great speaker, please let me know. Tonight's speaker is Doug Biggs, who was born and grew up in Ames, where his father, Don Biggs, taught geology at Iowa State. Doug's BA and MA are from Iowa State, and his PhD is from the University of Minnesota. He's currently a professor of history at the University of Nebraska, Kearney. He is, uh, we know him, we, we here at the Ames History Museum know him as an expert researcher on local history. But Doug says that when he got to college, he had a really great instructors in the medieval and ancient time periods that inspired him to go into medieval studies. Doug has taught in both American and British universities and has been a visiting professor at the Medieval Studies Center at the University of York in the UK and has given papers at professional conferences on both sides of the Atlantic, as well as in New Zealand. Who knew history would let you travel, Doug? Be a historian and travel the world. Uh, this, this past fall semester, Doug served as the J. William Fulbright Distinguished Chair in History at Palaki University in Olomouc, Czech Republic, where he taught several classes with colleagues there. In 2009, he expanded his historical interest to include the history of Ames in Iowa State, producing scholarly articles and publications in ISU's alumni magazine, as well as presenting these local history lectures. And we're so pleased to have him in our roster. For the Ames sesquicentennial in 2014, he and his wife, Councilwoman Gloria Betcher, who was sitting in the back corner back there, co-authored a book on Ames history that is for sale at the museum. His newest book on Ames and the Ames and College Railway in the 1890s is currently in press with Iowa State Digital Press and will be published later this year in paper. Please welcome Doug Biggs. Thank you so much. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. 
thank you, Kathy, for that very kind introduction. Um, thank you to the library and AHM for inviting me to do another of these talks. They've become an annual thing for me, and I enjoy them very much. And I hope I don't try the patience of my audience too much this evening. Um, I also want to give thanks for the tremendous amount of help that my wife Gloria gave me for finding some research materials for this piece and uh, a lot of what is good in here is her fault more than mine. Okay. Um, the decade of the 1890s in Ames, what I like to call the greatest decade, was a period of unqualified success in the history of every aspect of our community. The city saw a huge increase in population from 1,276 in 1890 to over 2,400 in 1900, a growth rate of 89.8%, which has neither been surpassed nor equaled in the 122 years since. The period witnessed a vast expansion in terms of the size and diversity of the business district and an accumulation of wealth that allowed for sufficient capital to be amassed so it was applied for the greater good of the community. It, was, it also saw, this decade also saw, a boom in technology in our community that saw the first working water system and in 1896, electric lights. And lasted by no means least, the building and development of a rapid transit system between Ames and the college two miles to its west and with it, the blending of what had been two communities for all their lives into becoming one the college in the city. Public education in Iowa before the 1890s was very much a work in progress. It was hardly standardized and not really professionalized at all. Schools were often of the one-room variety, and teachers, most of the time, had no credentials at all. Oftentimes, they were merely people who had an interest in teaching, or, all too often, had nothing else to do. <laughs> some were good, some were bad, some were just simply horrible. Teachers moved in and out of classrooms and schools, sometimes in the middle of a term, leaving students stranded, parents frustrated, and school administrators scrambling. Education was, in this decade, therefore uneven and often, if you will, at sea. By contrast, the 1890s were a decade of maturity, growth and professionalism in public education in the state of Iowa. By 1900, there were still many challenges ahead, as there are to this very day. But the courses that were necessary had been charted, and the way forward was clear. This forum has seen many aspects of Ames and Iowa State history covered over its 17-year period, 17-year lifetime. But as 2020 marked the sesquicentennial of Ames Public Schools, it seems only appropriate that some of our attention should be focused on this relatively neglected period or period of history of our community. Even those with the most passing interest of education in Ames know that the first school was built in 1861-1862 on land given by Lucian and Abigail Hoggett which of course has been preserved through the foresight of Farwell Brown and maintained today by our colleagues at the Ames History Museum. There's Hoggett School, and there are flyers on the table for the July events, and I am asked by our AHM uh, hosts to please direct your attention to this little 5 by 8 card, and um, the dates of the events and what the events are, are on the back. So if you would pick one up and um, please consider attending some of these. I know it may be a very warm day, but nonetheless, please consider attending some of these. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, oh, and uh, Henry May, this gentleman, was Ames's first teacher. But the city rapidly outgrew 
the one room building we call Hoggett School after just six years. Then in 1868, the building was abandoned. While outgrowing a one room schoolhouse may seem like great progress in barely six years, it's important to remember that Ames was not incorporated until December of 1870, and the 1870 census lists only 636 people in our town. While the city's population nearly doubled across the decade of the 1870s, from 636 to 1153, Ames was still really a very small place. Public education, as it was in other parts of the state, was very fluid in our community. Some students attended when they wished, others did not. Teacher training was likewise uh, uneven, and the better teachers would gravitate to larger cities where schools could pay them better. In the 1870s, Ames suffered from both issues as well as a nearly constant turnover in leadership. The principals in these decades led the community schools. They set the curriculum, and they saw it to the hiring of teachers, along with the discipline and moral behavior of students. The presence of the People's College on the high prairie two miles to the west of the city over the Iowa Creek led many in the community of Ames to desire the addition of a high school, which came in 1875. This was important because it was gonna be preparatory for college level education. High schools, of course, were of extreme importance in the 1870s and 1880s in Iowa because there were so few of them. They were generally confined to larger towns and Ames at fewer than 1200 residents was hardly a large city, but small communities would often start them anyway in the hopes of getting people to move to their community. These small community high schools like Ames that opened the doors of its high school again in 1875, also opened its doors to students from neighboring towns and rural districts if they paid tuition. Then as now, I, rural Iowa schools faced great challenges in terms of facilities, supplies, leadership, as well as hiring and retaining good teachers. And this picture is from a rural school near, near Gilbert in 1897, and it didn't, it got cut off here when I did the picture, but almost none of these young women in the back row are wearing shoes. And a bunch of these uh, clothes are really pretty dirty, and you know, they might have just been at recess or whatever, but as you can tell, these folks um, are not high up on the socioeconomic spectrum. They're come from farms, and you know, it's hard to make things go in these small rural schools, one room rural schools. Um, thus, many families from both small, urban, and rural communities eagerly seized upon the opportunity that larger and more stable districts offered, and their students helped swell the ranks of the larger urban districts. Because these rural students were removed from their families during the week, schools needed to provide room and board for them in the towns in which they attended school, and Ames was no exception. For many of the young men and women who came to Ames public schools throughout the 1870s and 80s and 90s, their ultimate goal was to get into college, and many applied for admission to Iowa Agricultural College, of course, just off two miles to our west. <laughs> Under the leadership of a guy that the only name I can find is Mahan, his last name, Principal Mahan, in 1875 to 1876, and his immediate successor, Principal Ashton, in 1876, the academic year of 76-77, Ames organized his high school. Um, but this was more difficult and less effective than it sounds at first. The great American educational reformer from the first half of the 19th century, the great Massachusetts uh, educationalist, Horace Mann, um, forcefully argued uh, in the 1820s and 30s that all children should spend no fewer than 10 months every year in the classroom. But in some Western states, this may have been achieved, but in Iowa, it rarely was. Even as late as 1898, some schools were not in session even half that time. 
uh, while Mahan and Ashton had established the high school, neither stayed in Ames. And it was not until Principal Gerard in 1878, 1879, that good quality teachers were hired for Ames High and the first graduates were produced. Gerard's departure from Ames in 1879 meant that there had been three principals in just four years. This revolving door of leadership meant that the curriculum and standards had changed almost every year. And all the standards for graduation had been completely revised every single year, which made it incredibly difficult to actually graduate. Um, this period of confusion ended with the hiring of William Chevalier as principal of Ames Schools in 1880. Chevalier stayed in his post uh, for 10 years until his departure with the graduating class of 1889 to lead the community schools in Radcliffe. Um, throughout this time, much had changed. He possessed a vision of what the district could be along with the energy to achieve it. He hired teachers who have good, were of good quality and who stayed for long periods. His vision and abilities also allowed for the implementation of a new and what seemed to be for the time cutting edge curriculum in 1883. For example, the reading and learning of letters for students in the elementary grades were based on Lewis Baxter Monroe's chart method, which is often considered better in, the, in this period than the old way of learning the ABCs. Monroe, who lived from 1825 to 1879, published widely in his lifetime on reading and speech acquisition in children. His chart primer, or first steps in reading, went through no fewer than six editions before his death. And he argued that the old method of teaching ABCs was neither efficient nor effective. He argued that one should only teach the letters that students needed to know when they needed them, okay? Rather than try to, you know, push them all into their head, only use the letters that they need. Therefore, learning to spell words like cat and bat and rat and sat, etc., was best because then the students understood how to use all the letters to make those simple words. This gave the student, he argued, a reasonable vocabulary after learning only a small number of letters. And this could be applied to more rapid learning as the curriculum progressed. He also argued strongly that students needed to be spoken with. These are his words, spoken with, not to. So you had to actually interact with your students on a daily basis and get them to read, get them to spell, get them to learn from themselves, from each other, and from the instructor. Don't just stand up and lecture at them. Uh, and they needed to be taught to interact. In our time as a professional educator, we would probably call this a flipped classroom. But in the 1880s, it was a relatively novel concept. And it was claimed that only the most forward-thinking teachers and forward-thinking districts used his methods. High school curriculum was also, it seemed, cutting edge and included English reading based on Appleton's fifth reader, the fifth edition of Appleton's reader. This was an, an anthology of the most significant short pieces of literature from great authors compiled by a trio of Yale University academics. It was very popular in high schools after the American Civil War, especially in the North, and Chevalier thought highly of it. American history was based on Joel Dorman Steele's Barnes History of the United States. Steele, like Monroe, was a mid-century educator who wrote prol prolifically on a whole series of educational issues, including chemistry, physics, human physiology, zoology, and American history. His American history went through no fewer than 14 editions, down to the last in 1903. It is neat, it is clean, it is teleologic. It is a triumphalist view of European civilization over the barbarism of native peoples that they found here. It is fitting for an age in which it was published. 
and it represented cultural and political biases current at the time. Chevalier's curriculum, based on many of the best textbooks and pedagogical methods available at the time, appeared to bear the fruit that he wished. School district records, and I'm grateful to Alex for helping me find some of these. We're digging them up in the, in the archives. We didn't even know they were there. Um, uh, are sadly incomplete for the 1880s and 90s, but they do demonstrate an impressive number of high school graduates from such a small town. Out of a senior class of 13 in 1887, uh, where am I? Uh, 12 graduated, and there's kind of a blurry picture, sorry, but that's the graduating class of 1887. Their student records show they performed well in all of their studies. In fact, the lowest grade, the average of all the graduating senior grades uh, was 88%, and that was one Edward Giddings. The next year, 1888, 10 students out of a class of 18 received their diploma. And like the year before, only one student was below, an, an average below of 89%. And that was Frank Meredith with an 88. Most of them are in the high 90s, and several of them are hundreds. Complete perfection for four years of high school. Pretty darn good, if you ask me. Uh, that wasn't me, that's for sure. Um, this number of graduates was really pretty impressive for a town with a population of under 1,200 souls. And they appear to bear out the appearance that Chevalier and his teachers provided significant service to their district, their students, and their parents who sent them there. And as well as preparing these people for lives of what must have been unqualified successes. <laughs> well, not quite. While attaining a high school diploma from Ames in the 1880s uh, seems like a really great idea, and it certainly is impressive, um, the AHS diploma, unfortunately, in these from these years, turned out to be a bit of a chimera, something that just really wasn't quite there. An analysis of the names from the graduates from 1887 onwards through the rest of Chevalier's time demonstrates that despite high grades and a high school diploma, none of them were successful at the college level. In fact, all of them who graduated from Ames High and went to IAC simply didn't graduate, including one Moulton Morse who left AHS in 1887 to join the preparatory department at the Agricultural College because the instruction was better, did not graduate from college either. So this isn't kind of what we wanted. At first glance, this evidence seems pretty damning as to the great inflation that seemed to run unchecked in Ames High's classroom under Chevalier's leadership. Having graduates who struggled or failed at the college level, it should be noted was not just an Ames problem, but a common one throughout Iowa schools, especially central Iowa schools in the 1880s and even in the 1890s. The crux of the problem centered on the fact that in, a, in an effort to legitimize their curriculum and to achieve success for their students, at the next college level, many districts just simply spread themselves too thin. Having teachers teach too many subjects that they were not prepared for. In essence, trying to do too much. William Orson Payne pointed out in his 1911 History of Story County that in the 1880s and 90s, and I quote, the average of the best public education that was to be had in towns of the size and class of Nevada and Ames was at least two years short of what is now recognized as the standard for high school graduation. Despite this rather lackluster performance at the next level by graduates from his schools, um, with his curriculum that he designed, along with teachers he had hired and worked so diligently to retain throughout the 1880s, it does not seem that Principal Chevalier suffered any sort of backlash or critique, at least none that was played out in the newspapers, for the failure, the abject failure, if you will, of his graduates. Whatever prompted Chevalier to move and leave Ames in 1889 for Radcliffe is a mystery, but the school board hired one F.M. Morgan as new principal for the autumn term of 1889. And Morgan set about <laughs> the really unpleasant task 
of revising the curriculum and raising standards and expecting more out of his students. Chevalier was clearly a highly respected member of the Ames community, and Morgan, as a newcomer, faced a number of challenges as much loved teachers from the previous decade left in droves. And many teachers did not like um, Mor uh, Morgan's new curriculum. In fact, the 1888-1899 or 1889-1890 school year, from what we can tell, appears to have been somewhat of a disaster for the new principal. For example, the average daily attendance of students at all levels of the school, primary, secondary, and high, which was one of the hallmarks of Chevalier's time as principal, fell off markedly. I'll give you one example and then I'll you know, not bore you to tears. The winter term from January to the end of March in 1890, about 60 days, out of a total of 40 students enrolled in the high school, the daily average attendance was only 30, with 72 cases of tardiness and only two students possessed perfect attendance. For the second intermediate grade, the students, their, their performance, at least in terms of attendance, was even worse. Out of a total enrollment of 60 students, the average daily attendance was only 49, with 60 cases of tardiness and no students had perfect attendance. But the second primary grade was the worst of all. With a total enrollment of 62, a daily attendance of only 49, and a whopping 98 cases of tardiness and absence. And nobody had perfect attendance. Some of the challenges Morgan faced, of course, were his own doing because he brought in his own curriculum. And it appears to have frustrated many students and families alike. There's no doubt that Morgan worked to increase standards because out of a large senior class of 23 that he inherited in the 1889-1890 school year, there were only nine graduates. District record notes, district records note over and over that students were held back for poor performance, moved away, left the school, uh, or left to attend the college preparatory department. For the nine who graduated, four were noted as teaching, two got married, one moved to Illinois, and one went to study music in Boston. So hardly, you know, a high achieving class. A measure of Morgan's frustrations with his situation uh, may be noted in an open letter he sent to the Intelligencer in April of 1890. And I quote, none but an experienced teacher can fully realize the trying circumstances which surround a principal following one who had built up the school and molded public sentiment in the favor of his ideas and his methods of governing the same. Obviously, W.F. Chevalier. When we consider the warm feeling in the hearts of the pupils and parents for our predecessor and the great disappointments that necessarily attend a change of teachers, we feel thankful that we are still able to keep our doors open. If the good people of Ames desire thorough practical work, good discipline in their schools, and a high standards of morals to be maintained, we ask for an occasional kind word a close observation of our work, and for unprejudiced criticism. Clearly, Principal Morgan did not have a very good year. Um, out in 1890-1891, things did not go much better. Uh, out of a much reduced senior class of 13, only five graduated. Uh, Connie Brooks and Louise Hamilton um, were noted as being married. And two of the 13 dropped out and four more turned to farming rather than graduate. As Morgan strove to increase standards to produce better quality graduates, he exhorted the families in the district to send their children to Ames schools with a seriousness of purpose. He noted in another open letter to the intelligencer in March of 1891, and I quote, 
We do not want you to come here with a misunderstanding of things. Our schools are open to all of those who really desire to attain a higher and more thorough education than they are able to, to get at rural districts. If you desire to prepare to enter college, to teach, to graduate from our high school, you need to prepare what you, uh, what you wish to do. Make up your mind what you want to accomplish. Have an object in view before entering, and then willingly submit to the mental drills and discipline of your instructors, and you will be astonished at how rapidly you will make progress." Unquote. One of the things that helped Principal Morgan's cause was, uh, for reform, was a new set of admission standards at Iowa Agricultural College that in turn came with a new president in February of 1891. William Beardshear saw far and deep, and he was a man of broad horizons and one who possessed great aspirations. He wished to enhance the position of his institution in the minds of Iowans, from politicians on Capitol Hill in Des Moines to farmers in the most remote corner of the state. Beardshire was a lifelong teacher and one who knew that higher education needed to work and support the public schools in word as well as deed. One of the first ways he helped to form a bond with local school districts throughout the state may be evidenced in the printing of the 1891 college catalog in which Iowa State printed a list of no fewer than 27 high schools across the state, including Ames, Nevada, Des Moines, Atlantic, and even as far away as Forest City. Graduates from these approved schools were exempt from taking the burdensome um, entrance exams for the, to enter college in the 1870s and 80s that kept so many students out. Um, and the new admissions policy enabled Iowa State enrollments to swell over the 1890s from 427 in 1891 to over 1,000 by 1900. And it helped the cause of Ames School District reformers like the principals across the 1890s, Morgan, Carstens, and Culbertson, who wanted their students to get into IAC and succeed. Thus, it is not surprising to find that all the principals that come to Ames in the 1890s spent a lot of time consulting with President Beardshear up at the campus as both the Ames Intelligencer and the Ames Times reported again and again and again across the decade. And it is also not surprising to find William Beardshear serving as the Ames High Commencement Speaker in 1895 and his good friend and Dean Edgar Stanton serving in the same capacity in 1898. But Despite Morgan's reforms, there is some evidence to suggest that they were really not enough to make a great impact. And the example of that is one Hazel Beardshear, President Beardshear's eldest daughter. Uh, she obviously had come with her dad from Toledo, where he had served as president of Western College until 1889, and then to Des Moines where he served as superintendent of Des Moines Public Schools for one year before moving to Iowa State. It is telling, I think, I argue, that Hazel, in her senior year, did not go to Ames High. Rather, she chose to go to the Iowa Agricultural College Preparatory Department because instruction there was better. We were out of frustration a hope for a better job, or just in need of a change of scenery. W.F. Morgan departed Ames in January of 1892 for Lake City and was replaced by C.C. Carstens. Like Morgan and Chevalier before him, Carstens faced a number of practical as well as educational challenges. Carstens fought measles and outbreaks of diseases and the fear of those outbreaks like typhoid as well as the bug of tardiness and absenteeism. And of course, these were not casual concerns. As we have seen, even in the best times, tardiness and absenteeism were frustrating issues for schools to work with. But there were also these really nagging curricular issues for Karstens to clean up, if you will. 
And one of the most frustrating that Carstens himself wrote and noted in his book of graduates um, in 1892 is the example of one Alice Stuxlager. Alice had started Ames High. I remember she graduates in 1892. She'd started Ames High in 1888. And Karstens noted that her successful progress toward the diploma had been, and these are his words, I quote, sidetracked by many changes in the course curriculum under principles Chevalier, Morgan, and now himself. So that she had done three years of high school work in five. Looking back over the gulf of 130 years, it is not difficult as a professional educator to admire Alice's spirit and her work ethic, in addition to the patience of her parents who put up with this. Like Morgan before him, Karstens faced a difficult task in changing the curriculum, rising or raising academic standards, and properly preparing graduates for the rigors of the classroom. He noted in an open letter to the Ains Times in June of 1893, and I quote, that although no class was ready for graduation this June, in fact, Ains graduates nobody in 1893, the prospects are good for a class in June of next year. In view of the fact that in so many cases, students have left our schools to enter uh, the college and our community without having the preparation necessary for profitable and thorough work, we take the liberty to say that in our opinion and in the opinion of the leading educators of this state and country, college work should follow high school work but never take the place of it. The high school seems to be in a state of transition, he wrote, but a wholesome growth in earnestness and thoroughness in the work is manifest, unquote. Quite probably the most frustrating aspect of the job Carson's held centered on the fact that, and I quote again, the course of study that has been adopted in some particulars is clearly ahead of the pupils who come from the eighth grade. So even within the system itself, students graduating from eighth grade could not succeed within their own high school. Um, but in view of the fact that the high school course will not receive due recognition in the state unless it does the work now laid out for it, the remedy seems to be strengthening the grades below. To this task, the principal will address himself in the coming year. While Ames High School had not produced graduates in 1893, four students did graduate in 1894. One of them was this gentleman right here, Harry Brown. And some of you may know this name. This is the father of Farwell T. I think it is worthy of note here that this is a high school diploma and it's from the Farwell T. Brown Photographic Archive. And I was looking for its companion and I couldn't find it, Kathy. I don't know if, it, I don't know if Farwell had it or Farwell put it up, but there should be a corresponding Iowa State College diploma in 1898. So Harry Brown is not the first, but in the 90s, one of the first to come out of Ames High and succeed at Iowa State in four years. So you can begin to see that the reforms are taking effect and they're beginning to bear the fruit that the Ames School District wishes, okay? Um, Carson's last class came in 1895 with another four graduates coming from Ames High, including one Katie Goble, whose name may be familiar to some of you, who entered IAC and four years later graduated in the class of 1889. Or 1899. The intelligencer noted that Carson's was leaving Ames in 1895 after four years, but he had done so much to reform the educational system and bring Ames into line with the best schools in the state. The fact that Ames High graduates now enrolled and succeeded at Iowa State provides really good evidence to support the intelligencer's claim. 
Karstens knew that reasons uh, or that reforms that sorry, Karstens knew that for his reforms to succeed, he needed the support of good, high quality teachers. And he helped his cause of recruiting and retaining teachers by getting the Ames School Board to agree to raise teacher salaries. <laughs> and I don't go too far here. You might not like what I'm going to say next. Uh, the school board uh, agreed with him. And it decided to, in 1893, increase teachers' pay to $50 per month, or about 600 bucks a year. Now, that sounds pathetic. Okay, I get it. But to be fair, um, this is not really all that bad by 1890s standards. A day laborer in 1892 earned about 12 and a half cents a day, which adds up to about 360 bucks a year. And most IAC faculty in the same period made between 1500 or a thousand, sorry, and fifteen hundred dollars per annum. So six hundred dollars isn't really all that terrible. In fact, it's much better than it used to be. Um, one of the most important challenges that confronted Karstens from January eighteen ninety three onwards was a marked growth in enrollment. Ames was a growing community, and enrollments reflected this. By eighteen ninety five, Ames Public Schools had total enroll a total enrollment of over four hundred students. Now, certainly, some of this was due to families moving into the downtown area. But part of the enrollment growth rested in the annexation of the land around IAC, which had come in 1892-1893. This area, known for decades as the Fourth Ward, uh, contains a significant and growing number of students and families who needed to get to the school building downtown from their homes on the western edge of campus. In spite of the growing community to the south and west of the campus, the school board understood that there is no way it could build another school in Western Ames when there was only an average of six or seven students per class beneath high school. And of course, there was no water, there was no sewer, and there was no power in that part of town anyway. So it wasn't going to work until you know, they don't build Welch until 1907. Um, thus, Karstens undertook negotiations with M.K. Smith, the manager of this, the Ames and College Railway, to secure rides for Fourth Ward students from the campus terminal to the city and back again. Smith and Karstens reached an agreement in 1893 where the district paid a flat rate of $50 per month to the ANC for 12 students when attending Ames schools to board the Ames and College Railway, to board the Dinky, um, and ride for or to town in the morning, back home for lunch, back to town in the afternoon, and then back home after 3 o'clock, or after 3.15, every day, okay? What, 20 cents a day, more or less. Um, it does not seem, it's, this looks great, and it is great, okay, i give you that. But it does not seem that the agreement between the AIM schools and the ANC was ever updated or reviewed, because in 1903, when the Ames community school population in the fourth ward reached 75 students, the district was paying still only $50 a month to the Ames and College Railway to transport them all. And, you know, uh, if you're a capitalist in the room, you know this is not such a great idea. But if you're a school person in the room, you think this is a really good deal. <laughs> no one's going to complain about this at any time. And I don't think anybody ever did at the school district. But, um, and this, you know, points out, I think, one of the most, uh, the most interesting aspects of the ANC. Um, the Dinky was many things. But I think first and foremost, it was a servant of its community. And the people who owned it and the people who ran it often would look more to serve the needs of the community, both Ames and college, than the bottom line, which is one of the reasons that this thing becomes so obsolete by 1904, even though it totters on to its eventual demise in 1907. Um, 
and I should say just make it complete, the flat rate of 50 bucks a month was still unchanged when the actual rate that the ANC should have been charging the 75 students was $300 per month, but they never did. Um, so the way that's the way it is. Uh, getting the Anderson College to transport students was a major accomplishment for Principal Karstens in 1893, but it did not solve the vexing problem of once you brought them all into the city and you brought them all into the school, where were you gonna teach them? Because he just didn't have enough space. And there was no room in the existing school building to teach them. And the school board did not have uh, enough money and did not want to push forward a bond issue to build a new building. So Karsten spends a lot of time in 1893, 1894, 1895, which you can trace in the newspapers, uh, renting church basements to teach everybody. And these move throughout the downtown area. Sometimes it's a congregational church they rent, sometimes it's method, you know, it's all over the place. It just depends on what's available in any given term. Um, part of Kirsten's reforms of the Ames public school system centered on the fact that Ames teachers became incredibly involved in both the Story County Teachers Association and the State Teachers Association meetings. This, the county group held monthly meetings throughout the year, usually on Saturdays, uh, and these county meetings were supplemented by joint meetings with nearby counties to the benefit of the teachers and administrators of all communities involved. These county and regional meetings were seen by many rural schools as desirable and even necessary because they needed the ideas and experience of their fellow educators in the larger towns and cities. There was usually a keynote speaker in each one of these meetings at the luncheon with sessions both in the morning and the afternoon dedicated to certain topics. Ames teachers in these years of Karsten's principalcy presented monthly on a wide range of topics. For example, when the Story County teachers met in Ames in January of 1893, topics included the use of the blackboard in both primary and secondary schools, and how to cultivate a taste for good literature in third and fourth grade reading students. Now, I'm not sure how you can do that, but that was a topic. It was not long before Ames teachers were collaborating with their fellows in neighboring communities for the benefit of the teachers and administrators who attended the meetings. For example, in February, the next month in 1893, Ames teacher uh, Miss Arnold and Boone teacher Miss Thompson collaborated on a presentation, Is Language Successfully Taught? And the intelligentsia reported that this presentation generated a great amount of good discussion that would certainly be to the benefit of students in the future. These joint meetings were also incredibly well attended. And the paper noted in February of that same year that 20 Boone County teachers showed up and over 50 teachers from Story County. Karstens and many of his teachers also began to swell the ranks of the Story County Normal Institute over the summer each year. These meetings were actually courses that were held to give teachers an 1890s equivalent of professional development. And everybody who has been a teacher in this room knows all about professional development, right? So that's what this kind of is, okay? And, um, uh, remind. In 1893, Karstens presented some lectures to a large audience, the intelligencer said, quote, large audience, of 136 attendees. By 1895, topics included the influential teacher presented by Ames teacher Edna Meek. And what was becoming a really important topic in the 1890s, and we see this again and again, and I quote, home study for teachers, okay? Uh, and they were now expected by many of their districts to keep up to date in their subjects and model what we, I think, would call in our lifetime, lifelong learning, right? Everybody's, everybody who's a teacher has said that at least once. <laughs> it's what we do. Um, but to be fair to Principal Karstens and his teachers, he had, and they had, possessed an even bigger worldview than simply the state or the county. And over the summer break of 1893, Karstens and his entire teaching staff got on trains and attended 
that the World's Fair in Chicago, the Great White City. And somehow the school board paid for all that. <laughs> but that's what they did. Um, and the intelligentsia could not help but comment that the students in the classrooms in Ames in the next years would benefit greatly from what their teachers and principals saw at this great exposition. Upon Karsten's departure from Ames in 1895, the school board brought in one E.D.Y. Culbertson to be principal. And as the district grew and matured, his role transformed from principal into that of superintendent, who's the first superintendent of Ames. But Culbertson's time as principal slash superintendent was markedly different than Chevalier's, Morgan's, or Karsten's, in that Culbertson did not spend a great amount of time or energy rebuilding or reestablishing curriculum. Some of this was due to Karsten's good work, there's no doubt of that, but also was due to the fact that the State Department of Education itself was maturing, setting statewide standards, and holding statewide meetings that attracted more and more people to create a more homogeneous curriculum, or at least agreed to curricular ideas that meant there was not so much uh, necessity to reinvent the real wheel every time you got a new principal or a new superintendent. Uh, as Ames grew to just over 2,400 residents by the turn of the century, the community itself became large enough to support a district of significant size, pay teachers more money, and professionalize the schools. Many of Karsten's initiatives continued under Culbertson and were expanded. For example, in November 1895, the intelligencer noted that a group of Ames teachers had gone to Chicago not to visit this, which was long gone by then, but to, the, to visit the Chicago public schools, observe teaching methods, observe classrooms, learn from curriculum, and bring all this back to Ames. And the paper noted that the teachers had returned with a tremendous number of ideas that would enhance Ames students' experience because, and I quote the intelligencer, of these teachers' powers of observation. While Coverson and his teachers continued to attend the Story County Teachers Association meetings on a monthly basis, the topics of the seminars and the papers changed. And in the last years of the decade, they took on a far more theoretical and less practical tone. No longer do we see entire morning sessions devoted to how to use the blackboard. But instead, we see entire morning sessions on things like the bright side of teaching. Why do you want to do this? Why is it fun? Why is it necessary? The dark side of teaching. Why is it not so fun? The teacher's dream, which was probably summer vacation coming tomorrow. Um, and in May of that same year, Professor William Wynn from Iowa State presented to the teachers a biographical and intellectual sketch on the life of Horace Mann, as we've already seen before. Um, there is no doubt that Ames teachers benefited from these meetings, but to be fair, as in all things, because I know there's a bunch of teachers in the room, some of these meetings, and we've all been to them, were, more be were just better than others. Yeah? Everybody's been to those, right? And the 1890s were no different. Uh, the intelligencer could just not help but report in January of 1896, that the meetings of the Story County Teachers Association in Ames were, well, not quite successful. As the paper said, um, they'd heard teachers saying, and I quote, well, wasn't that a dry meeting? <laughs> and I wasted all that time? And yes, I think so. <laughs> With an unbridled positivism that's so typical of the intelligencer in the times in the 1890s, the paper chastised the teachers, you know, like doing this, and saying, and I quote, these teachers did not move through the entire convention to give any life to the association, nor themselves. And they went on to exhort their fellow, uh, their fellows and the teachers in the association to come out for the next meeting and give life to the, uh, to the meeting and life, to what they were doing in their, in their work. 
And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure that went with a farm. But anyway, that's, that's, you know, everything wasn't unicorns and rainbows. So, you know, it, is, it was what it was. I think that's a fun vignette. Under Culbertson's leadership, Ames schools continued to mark, march toward rigorous preparation of high school students for success at, the, success at the next level. Some parents may have had frustrations with the curriculum and its rigor, but the over-inflated over -inflated grades had become a thing of the distant past, along with unprepared graduates. And Iowa State saw Ames High students attend and succeed with predictable regularity. The Times reminded its readers in February of 1897 that a high school education was not for everyone. And while, and I quote, there are many boys and girls who enter high schools, but only few have the grit to complete the required work for graduation. The high school sifts and tests. Those who pass are worthy and well qualified, and as a rule have made suitable proficiency in the preceding work to warrant them receiving the marks of honor, the high school diploma. Life is always a struggle, the newspaper reported. Each boy and girl deserves to be encouraged in upward strife, unquote. Culbertson's work and the work of his teachers was recognized, actually, in a nice award for their success and the success of their students at the Story County Fair in September 1897. And I know this is going to sound terribly silly, but I think it's, it, it's worth noting. This was a fact, these awards, this success did not go unnoticed by donors. And the Times noted later that year that after hearing of the award at the Story County Fair, an anonymous donor gave their entire library to Ames High School. Now, it was valued at over $17, but for the 1890s, you know, it was probably more than one book. And the newspaper noted that another donor, hearing of this first donation, had pledged a similar gift of their library to the Ames High School when, you know, in the future. So, you know, it sounds silly, but people are beginning to notice. Um, well, it seems that all things rushed toward professionalism and standardization in the 1890s, there were some important voices that cautioned that public education was all too often driven forward at great speed, heedless of direction, and that it should pause now and again to take stock of where it was or is and where it might be going. One of those voices was nobody of less stature than William Beercher himself. In December of 1898, Beard Trudeau delivered a paper at the State Teachers Association meeting in Des Moines on, and I quote, are the public schools meeting the needs of their students, unquote. He said that public schools in the state were doing a credible job, in his opinion, at preparing students for their futures. But he also noted that, and I quote, yet so high do the American, do the American people expect and demand of the schoolmaster now abroad in the land that his job is overly stressful, unquote. And the high turnover rate in so many districts that, you know, that they experienced in uh, superintendents and principals and teachers in Beercher's mind was understandable. He noted that uh, schools across the state, in his view, and I quote, uh, neglected the dignity of the laboring classes, the trades, in a rush to produce more college educated folk, unquote. He also noted that there is a realm of what might also be termed crazes. And everybody knows who's been in the classroom. I'm exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, crazes, those are his words, that, uh, wait a minute, crazes that overtake the teachers of the land in the development of their educational methods. There come along these crazes and methods of reading to which, if you did not subscribe, you were supposed to be behind the times. There are these fresh enthusiasms and methods of writing that will split the dress sleeves of the girls to give us popular muscular activity for news discoveries, or that will do some form of writing radically different from that of our childhood. There spring up these enthusiasms and teaching numbers of which is like the matter of feeding the sun brilliant today, common tomorrow. There are then, there are then methods of child study that have in them elements of real worth, yet run to extremes that make some of us one-sided in the forming of the youth. 
And then there is the realm of fads, not because there is no real merit in the addition of new studies, but because we become one-sided in the advocacy of new branches to the slighting at times of those that must ever be at the foundations of things in character and civilization, unquote. While William Beardshire could just as easily have given that speech today, his words were lost in the inexorable march of the country toward newness, growth, and progress. As the decade of the century closed, Ames stood as one of the leading districts in the state. The class of 1898 comprised 17 graduates, the most in Ames history. The days of students averaging 100% scores across three years of high school were long gone. And while that graduating class did have a number of students above the 90th percentile, just as many were in the 80s, good, solid students, but not overconfident and filled with a false sense of success because of the grade inflation that had plagued their predecessors only a decade before. Of the five students that made up the AHS senior class of 1899, or only five students made up the class of 1899, but as the new century dawned, it brought more students that would swell the ranks of the senior classes in the next decade. The last decade of the century also saw the Ames School District come of age in terms of politics within the county. The Ames Times noted in February of 1899 that one Wilson Rich, a, story, a teacher from Ames with a degree from Iowa State would run for the superintendent of the Story County school system, which would give that individual a tremendous influence in allocating resources, interacting with politicians in Des Moines and the County Board of Supervisors and set policy for every school, in, or every school district in the county. It is hardly surprising to find both the intelligencer and the Times supporting his candidacy. And even though Rich failed to win, his presence on the ballot clearly demonstrates that Ames schools had come a long way since the 1880s and boded well for this leadership in the next century, as did the school board's $1,000 and successful $1,000 bond issue in 1900 to build this a four classroom addition to the old original high school, which had lost its tower by this time. Okay, what in the end are we to make of this? First, we can see that Ames schools were very much a work in progress in the 1870s and 80s. While principals Mahan and Aston had developed the school in the mid 1870s, and William Chevalier brought order to the district, um, while Chevalier's, you know, curriculum and methods of instructions were certainly popular with both students and parents, his graduates were not successful at any level. And no student from Ames High who intended um, IAC in his term as uh, principal ever graduated. Their inflated grades gave them a, sense, a false sense of security, and they were unprepared to succeed in college. Second, we can see that both principals Morgan and Carson's faced her a Herculean task of raising standards, increasing enrollment, acquiring and retaining good teachers, and not alienating parents and students. Carson's, it seems, was more successful than Morgan. His work to bring up teacher salaries brought him good and loyal teachers who often stayed. And though Ames attended, and through Ames attendance, or Ames teachers' attendance, at Story County and State Teachers Association meetings, as well as visits to singular events like the World's Fair in 1893, all these teachers and administrators gained a broader perspective, which informed their classrooms and gave their students insights that other less fortunate teachers did not possess. Carstens was able to put the district on a stable footing, and Culbertson took over in 1895. From this date, Ames schools seemed to mature, as the curriculum stabilizes, Ames teachers become more professionalized, and their monthly teachers association meetings begin to focus on the more theoretical aspects of education, like being an inspiring teacher rather than using the blackboard or cultivating a taste for good literature in third graders. Third and last, it is clear that Ames students were the obvious beneficiaries of this reform and professionalism, as by the middle years of the 1890s, AHS graduates were going to IAC and graduating with predictable regularity. Of course, as so many of us in this audience know, 
All education is a work in progress. As Beardshire noted in 1898, it is all too often driven by fads and crazes. And how many fads and crazes have all of us seen over the 30 or more years of our teaching lives? But across the 1890s, AIM schools became much more cosmopolitan in outlook as teachers expanded their worldview and their experiences. And this, I think, is very important. As Beardshear says, and he sums up this idea at the close of his 1898 presentation to the State Board or the State Teachers Association, and I think these are important words, so I'll read them. And I quote, the best education and the truest system of education, however logically designed and determined, must grow in the light of world ideas. The Germans had a saying, he noted, beyond the mountains, there are people. Education will not end, he continued, with the citizenship of one country, but in the cosmopolitanism of all countries, that we will go back, nay, not back, but forward, to the Grecian idea of a cosmos, a worldly order in education and Christianity. Thanks. Thank you so much, Doug, for that great presentation tonight. If we'll open it up for questions, if anybody has one, feel free to raise your hand and I'll come by with the mic. And we'll go see if there's anybody online has any questions <laughs> either, too. Yeah, Everybody tuning in there. We got one in the back here. Oh. So how did you determine who graduated from Iowa State College? What sorts of records did you consult? Because I know, um, well, I no. guess you didn't consult <laughs> records. So what sources did you no, consult? I did consult. I did, it's in the catalogs. And up until, I think, 1910, the, all the graduating classes are listed in the catalogs, in the back of the catalogs, all the alumni. So yeah, it was easy to check. And I had some of the graduating classes that from the, those books that, those random, you know, books that Alex has at uh, AHM. So I get, I can, you know, I took all those pictures, I get the lists of the, of the AHS graduates, and I could go and look at the IAC one. So yeah, it, you know, it wasn't a lot, you know, it was none in the 1880s that I could track, but certainly in the, in the mid 90s on, then you get, you know, Harry Brown and Katie Goble and Katie Farr and people like that, that I know from my own research doing at Iowa State. So yeah, yep. We have a question online. Uh, where was the high school located? Um, it's just right across the street from the, or no, it's just where the, the current city hall is, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it was, right. they tore down the 1881 building to build in 1937, the building yeah. we now call AIM City Hall. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good one. We're talking about Eric Schmidt here. We, we started to get these schools numbers because it is so darn confusing talking about which central you have to ask. When people say they went to right. central and you'll be like, well, what era? What's east or west? Which original. side of the street here? Yep, there we go. I'll put the original <laughs> school building up. Here's the original. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of a bummer that they took the, the bell tower out. I think this kind of makes it pretty. Yeah, I've never heard any reason on why that part came down other than that's where the addition got tacked onto. I don't know if there was anything wrong with that. Yeah, I don't know. And this isn't, I don't, I don't have, you know, maybe, maybe with, when you look at the addition picture, oops, maybe that was, um, yeah, maybe that was, maybe that it just architecturally wouldn't work mm -hmm. to have that bell tower sitting there. You know, it's possible. Yep. Yeah. Um, in the 60s, I had a job uh, teaching in a three-room elementary school in um, Missouri, outside of Columbia. It was a county school. And the person who got to be principal was simply the teacher who'd been there the longest. So I'm not sure um, you know, then that person didn't have any special responsibilities for the overall curriculum or anything. So maybe some of those earlier principles just were not uh, in, imbued with that much responsibility, I don't know. Well, but in the 1960s, there'd been so much regularization and standardization. But in the 19th century, you know, it, as like Henry May, Henry May had no qualifications to do anything. You know, in fact, he was addicted to a number of substances and goodness knows what he was doing in a classroom, you know, but, um, 
it, it's a very different world because, uh, like I say, many teachers weren't um, weren't even uh, given a certificate or even certified to teach. They just simply showed up and taught in the 19th century. That's just what they did. And um, I have it. I cut it out because I didn't want to make this overly long. But I will answer your question very specifically. Um, quite frankly, where is it? Uh, it, it? It's an odd thing, I think, but a lot of teachers in 1900 were, were licensed, didn't have any kind of degree from any college or university. And the figures that are available in, um, who's, who is this? This is, this is from Beardtree's own paper. This is from his, his uh, um, no, that's not right. Which one is it? Six, four, five. Where's my, I just threw all my pages underneath and I shouldn't have done that now. Um, there it is. Do, 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 do. Uh, it's uh, from an article that's published in the Annal of Iowa by a guy named Keith Johnson, who's pulling it out of the State um, Teachers Association documents. In 1900, out of 12,983 licensed teachers in Iowa, only 6,367 of them had actually graduated from the State University in Iowa City, Agricultural College in Ames, the Normal School in Cedar Falls, um, a private college like Grinnell, all the rest received their licensure from county normal institutes. Four weeks of training in the summer. That's it. And goodness knows what those curriculum were. It depended on the people who taught them. So, you know, the, the, the things that we all had to do to achieve teacher certification, remember student teaching and all the forms you had to fill out and all the learning stuff you had to do, none of these people did that. It just wasn't what they did. It wasn't even thought of. It was very different. And I think you're probably right. Your experience has resonance, I think, with what I've been reading in the 19th century that uh, the senior teacher was often the principal because they'd been there the longest, so they got the job. And then they had to do a bunch of extra work, like, you know, sign everybody in and keep all the grades and blah, 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 blah. And then inter interface with the parents and because, you know, teachers wouldn't always need to do that. I suppose if you had a really pissed off teacher that came to your favorite room school and yelled at you, you know, but um, yeah, I think that's a very, that's a very different, it's a very different world. You know, even your world in the 1960s is very different than it is now. You know, I, I, is your three-room school still even there? Or is it long gone? It is a fairly, fairly new building. Oh, maybe they're still it's operating. Three Mile Prairie. Three Mile Prairie. It's a new story. So, I was curious to know what motivated you to do this talk. Kathy Stack. <laughs> I, I was going to do, Kathy and I talked about me doing a, a presentation on Lucian Hoggett. And then she said, no, 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 please, Eric, I want you to do something on the school. And I'm like, I'm going to the school. So now I know a little bit more. So, you know, it's fun. It was fun. It was a neat thing to do. It's, uh, you know, something that I really don't know anything about. So it was a good, it was a good thing for me to learn something new. And, you know, it's the, the research I don't think is, you know, uh, incredibly burdensome because, you know, most of what I, almost all of what I use is newspapers, except Alex was so fortunate uh, and helpful to me to come up with these cool things with the AHM, but it's all in English, it's all printed, you know, it's much better than having to go read Latin and French like I usually do. So, <laughs> Kathy. And do you think that the experience in Ames was pretty much paralleled throughout the state in other school districts? Do you think the same things were going on? I think in some ways, yes. I think in some, I mean, Nevada, I think that's, it's very clear that's true. You know, Boone probably, yeah. Des Moines, because it's so much bigger, it's hard to tell. Iowa City, it's so much bigger, it's hard to tell. Davenport, I mean, the, the Quad Cities, Dubuque, the bigger places of, you know, 70, 80,000 folks, that, that would be much more high bound, much more professionalized, much more regularized. Salaries would be higher. There'd be more schools. There'd be a need for more 
administration, more bureaucracy. You know, but I do think that um, in the 90s are that period of finding standardization, finding professionalization, especially these, these movements uh, that we see at the beginning of the early 90s that we have this, the county teachers associations. You know, that's, that's, and it's interesting that the teachers give up their Saturdays to go do these things, but they do. And I don't know if the principal would say, you know, and you go, you know, or what? But um, I think that's an interesting thing that they would go, and they, they present, I mean, these guys would present, they just wouldn't show up, they'd also present. And so, you know, it's a very different, different kind of thing, so. So the eight, 1890s nationally, We've got the, the panic of 1893 and right. finances are not in good shape. I know that Will Page in his research on Ames has said that Ames has done pretty well and come through the panic of 1893. And so I'm wondering if you saw anything in your research that suggested that the school district or the citizens of Ames were concerned about the money that was being spent on raising teacher salaries or taking the teachers to the World's Fair. Right. Well, from the stuff I've been doing um, on you know, this book project that I'm finishing up, uh, it's not until really very early 1894 that Ames begins to feel the first effects of the depression. Because um, there's a note in the Intelligencer that says that something like for the first time, the Chicago Northwestern is noting that business is slow. And we know, and this is again from this cool stuff that Alex has at the museum that he was very kind to share with me, uh, that the businesses 1890, 1891, 1892, 1893, they continue to grow. And I think that one of the reasons maybe Eric, why we don't get a new school in, or in addition, you know, this, this has to come in 1900. It's because probably by 1895, maybe 96, the board doesn't want to try to get into a bond issue over this because the big bond issue that comes to the city in 1896 <laughs> is still at the east end of Main Street and that's the power plant. And that was whopping, that was a whopping $12,000. So, and this, when this was built, this was $1,000. So a two-story brick, four-classroom addition was 1000 bucks. That was the bond issue. So, you know, I think that's probably why the school district didn't want to get in the middle of trying to get electricity. I mean, that, it's a, I'm just speculating, but that's a possibility because that's the big bond issue in the 1890. That and ex expanding the sewer and water system, which is not nearly as expensive as the power plant, but those bond issues come through in the 1890s as well. But, you know, Ames, that's one of the things too, and that's, you know, one of the points of my book, and, you know, I just get to plug my own stuff, but, um, you know, that makes all the difference. Sounds dumb, but that makes all the difference because people use it. So, yeah. so how did you get to Chicago in those days? By train. But from? From Ames. To Des Moines? Yeah, probably Ames to Des Moines and then Des Moines out. Although the main line, the Chicago Northwestern main line to Chicago runs through Ames, then is now. So, you know, you could have gone to Des Moines out if you're going to ride Rock Island rails, but you could also just ride straight from Des Moines. You might have to change trains in Dubuque or somewhere or Peoria or whatever, but, you know, depending on if you got the express, but yep. That's what you do. You just go on the train and head east, and you're heading that way, heading toward Chicago. Well, thank you so much tonight, Doug. We appreciate sure. your lecture sure. and give, schooling us on 1890s <laughs> school stuff here. Schooling us on the 90s, that's right. <laughs> and unfortunately, we don't have another lecture to plug because this is the end of the season, but feel free to join us out at Hoggett for we got one more month of programming out there, or come visit us down the Ames History Museum, or come back on the library and get some great books and reading material here. So thank you so much again, Doug, for yeah, presenting for us. Thanks for, for, thanks for having year. me, you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, you so much. Time.